Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to a webinar presented by RiskLine and Human Risk on ensuring duty of care in the new COVID-19 normal. Before we begin, there are a few items to go over. This webinar will be recorded. The recording and slide deck will be made available to everyone who registered by email after the webinar ends. If you have a question for our presenters, you can type it in the Q&A box found at the bottom of your screen, and we will answer a select few, if time permits, towards the end of the webinar. And finally, if you'd like to know more about RiskLine or Human Risks, feel free to get in contact with us at any time. And now for our introductions. My name is Suzanne Sangiovese, and I am the Commercial and Communications Director at RiskLine. My co-moderator today is Siobhan Anderberg, the Marketing Director at Human Risks. Siobhan will oversee the Q&A portion of today's webinar. Our first presenter is Emmanuel Scansani. Emmanuel is a Barcelona-based global security expert and the Director of Partnerships our second presenter today is Mads Paragord. Mads has years of experience with security risk management in various industries and is the founder of Human Risks. All right, good afternoon, Emmanuel. Hi, Suzanne, thank you very much. Um, so I'd like to start with a definition of duty of care. Um, we all know that duty of care is a moral and legal obligation for companies to look after their safety of their travelers. However, in recent years, there has been too much focus on the legal aspect rather than the moral side, and we can say that the result has been limited. COVID-19 changes all this balance, and today we are forced to find new dynamics and to see how we can adapt our interpretation of duty of care. Today, organizations need to become more proactive than ever before in order to ensure the safety of their employees. Because an important aspect that we should clarify right away is that duty of care still applies nowadays despite the current pandemic we are living in. But when we talk about workforce safety during this pandemic, we are not just talking about their physically, physical safety, but we are also talking about their mental health. So we are all living in a situation of unprecedented uncertainty. We don't know about our health, the one of our beloved ones, about the economy and about our values. We don't know what will happen. Your employees are living now under high levels of stress related to this, if not about anxiety, about coronavirus. More efforts have to be put now than ever before on emotional support to your employees. Fourth aspect I'd like to stress is that we can be all, all of us, be reassured that travel will resume. Local travel, probably soon, is already somehow resuming in some countries. International travel will not resume so soon. But once travel will fully resume, it will be a very messy situation, meaning the timeline of when a full resumption will take place will be very uncertain. And we will be traveling for some months, maybe many months, in a situation where the virus will still be a threat for many months. And new restrictions could be reintroduced at any time if uh, the outbreak should uh, worsen in any country around the world. If we consider the current situation where companies are acting, there are some challenges that we can find in every organization. The first one, as mentioned, mental health of your workers. Uh, I'd like to say in this regard that checking about their mental health, how they are coping with the current situation is much harder than just showing you care. So why showing we care about them is important we need to find practical ways to check how they are coping with the current situation second aspect uh in fact at the current situation companies are managing worker safety uh in a very different way than they were before as 
we are all uh, working from home in a home space in a different remote setting and there is no longer a shared physical space that can be controlled third we are in an environment that is dominated by COVID-19 related risks and it becomes very easy to lose sight of the fact that there may be other risks that can have a larger impact in a context that is already weakened by COVID-19. We can take the example of a natural disaster and what would happen if a natural disaster was to strike in a community already vexed by the current measures that are being taken. Four, uh, if we consider all this, we should remember that the impact on travel, the current collapse of travel and the disruptions to supply chains could get even worse. Finally, we should remember that there is going to be a new and highly complex regulatory environment. There will be new travel requirements, new medical certifications or visa requirements that your employees will need once they resume travel. How will companies be able to navigate through this complexity? Sixth, and possibly the most important challenge, there is a big amount of misinformation out there and there is a critical need now more than ever before, a need for actionable information. But when we talk about the crucial role of actionable information, it really helps if we look at the timeline of this pandemic. So I think as we move ahead day by day, week by week, there is a general consensus that the WHO and the national government's response, who also base their response and their advisories on the one of the WHO, has been incredibly slow. Instead, Relying on local information has allowed a travel risk intelligence company like Chris Klein to respond quickly on what was taking place in Hubei province of China. So if we take a look at the timeline, we can see that um, there has been a period of time of nearly two months from when the WHO declared in the middle of January that there was no risk of human to human transmission. And then two months later, on the 11th of March when they declared the global pandemic. So these two months would have greatly, greatly increased the chances to prepare for what was happening for any organizations already implementing and making use of intelligence. So I would like to elaborate more on this. We can see that having access to the right intelligence based on analyzed and verified local information has multiple advantages such as the most important one knowing what happens before others do so in most cases nowadays this will mean knowing what is happening about new infections medical development of the outbreak um, response taken by uh, national and local authorities around the world and what is the impact on the community second this type of intelligence will also be able to detect and put together any change in regulation and advise employees and their organization on how to behave. We can take a good look on what has been the experience of RiskLine in covering COVID-19. The first alert that was issued by our analyst on this happened on the 1st of January 2020, on the 1st of January of this year. This has been an incredible amount of time before what uh, eventually happened did happen. And also, we could look at the example of when a full lockdown was for the first time introduced um, in the world when it happened in Wuhan on the 23rd of January. Our intelligence work was able to notify all travelers and their organization of what would happen six hours before a full lockdown will take place. This will give a very good advantage and a very good lead time to prepare for any response. Second, very important role of critical uh, information and intelligence is to leave out noise and filter out fake news. Relying on pre-verified sources analyzed by professional analysts is the best way of making sure that you keep fake news and noise out of, out of your radar. 
Finally, relying on the right type of intelligence can get your organization more predictive power on what could be happening and where. So how can we reformulate duty of care during COVID-19? I think there are five elements that we need to consider. The first one is that there is a greater sense of insecurity, a sense of vulnerability and uncertainty. Um, there is a shift, a greater shift towards needing emotional support by your employer and needing to provide this to your employees. Remember that informing is caring. Second, as mentioned at the opening of my webinar, there is an uncertain timeline and we can expect a very messy resumption of travel. There will be restrictions to movement, to free travel that can be reintroduced at very short notice. There will be a new regulatory environment with a lot of changes and differences from region to region and even within region. Third, Organizations should remember that they are now part of a national strategy to fight coronavirus. So it's more crucial than ever that organizations give their employees accurate information and educate their workers on the risks they are currently facing. Fourth, a very important point, duty of care solutions, duty of care tools are now needed absolutely by small and medium enterprises whereas earlier they would have been something that would have been a privilege of larger organizations but a solution duty of care solution for a small and medium enterprise it cannot be so easily imagined it would have to be something affordable something flexible and something customizable to the size of the sme finally we can think about what should be what are new travel risk management goals i think there are three main points to stress first share intelligence to your employees granted that you have access to the right intelligence first b make sure that your workers remain compliant your organization will have to operate in a very different regulatory environment and the need for compliance will be very high Third point, strengthen your ability to locate and communicate with your workers, no matter they are from ho working from home or they are already working in their office. So companies should do whatever they can and make uh, most use of all the travel tech available if they want to meet their new duty of care obligations during COVID-19. In addition, through real-time intelligence, which is crucial, there is now need for a strong tracking platform and an app that are able to support essential functions, such as requesting a check-in and locate where your employers are, even if they are working from their home base. Second, you need to have um, the possibility to communicate either with a mass message or directly one one with your workers without relying on email and making use for example of push notifications third live tracking of your employees even if they are not currently traveling and they are home-based can be very important in the case of an emergency At RiskLine, Klein, we can help with both. For the intelligence part, we make available in real time all the travel risk intelligence we have on our portal, on our app, or through our APIs. Your company can rely on different risk assessments for COVID-19, assessments that are looking at different countries worldwide, assessments that are looking at all countries and regions and cities around the world and with an increasing level of detail on what is happening in local communities. As for the tracking part, organizations should be using geofencing technology to create polygons around their workplace of their employees, even if they are working from home. 
This would allow companies to achieve two important things. First, companies will get notified immediately if there was any case of non-compliance from their workers. Second, organizations will be able to detect immediately if there was an emergency happening near to the home of your employees. Finally, integration between a tracking platform and an app allows for mass or direct messaging and enable live tracking, which can be absolutely needed in case of an emergency. I think we can summarize um, all what we have discussed into five takeaways. The first one, um, your organization needs to become much more proactive than it has been so far. Your employees are working, they are operating in an environment over which you have no control. So you need to have access to the right type of information and you need to strengthen your travel risk management tools. Tools that allow you to achieve precisely that, locate, message and respond. Second, as mentioned, you need to rely on trusted intelligence. Intelligence which can be the only base over which to build a solid travel risk management program. Third, intelligence will become more and more necessary if we consider that regulatory complexity could be extremely high in the next month that lie ahead. Fourth, more efforts need to be put in educating travelers and in preparing travelers about a fully new risk environment. The environment your organizations are operating currently and the environment your workers are currently in is a fully changed environment and we can expect this environment to change even more in the next few months and as travel resume. My final consideration goes to the fact the duty of care tools will no longer be questioned, their cruciality, their importance, and they will become a baseline security measure for any duty of care program adopted by organizations around the world. So thank you. This is the end of my presentation. I'd like now to pass the word to Matt from Human Risks. Thank you so much, uh, Emmanuel. I'll be uh, taking over the, um, the screen here and share it with you. Thank you so much for participating, everybody. Um, um, thank you, Emmanuel, for redefining duty of care in uh, certainly new times for everybody. I will take a look and talk about how managing security risks is changing during a crisis and uh, also a pandemic like this, well, any crisis really, and we'll take a look on how there is a change in the uh, threat landscape and how that influences our work as a security professional, uh, why staying updated is critical and a few ideas on how to do it, and then uh, how to uh, best mitigate the uh, threats that uh, we have identified in this new landscape. And then finally, a few words uh, on business continuity management, which um, I guess stating the obvious will definitely be part of this new normal as uh, organizations have to adapt to uh, disruptions in, uh, in business as uh, usual. Um, if we take a look at the threat landscape, um, there is you know, definitely a, obviously a change in, in working, from, uh, working from home versus working at the office or wherever. And that also introduces a, a new uh, number of threats. Um, we definitely still need more data to support this from a sort of a more scientific uh, standpoint, but there are tendencies and there are of course also, uh, you know, stating the obvious to everybody. Um, in order to ensure the duty of care obligation that, that you also talked about, Emmanuel, we, we wanna ensure that our employees are safe and we have to take a look at the different elements here. Uh, in terms of physical security, you know, we have to review that our existing guidelines and standards um, support and ensure a safe uh, working environment now that people have worked physically or moved physically from the office space and into the private homes. Um, I've been surprised also how many organizations still rely on physical documents, even though a lot of the processes are digitized. 
So how do we, uh, our employees store physical documents safely and in a secure uh, manner? And then there's the whole health and safety aspect to it as well, you know, having a safe and sound environment to work in. So as we can already see here, there's different uh, silos, if you will, that is typically uh, divided into different departments in the, in the organization from health and safety or legal or risk or security and compliance that has to work together into a, a greater uh, detail here uh, in order to support this uh, new normal in the COVID-19 reality. And then there is cyber, of course. We have seen uh, a huge increase in cyber attacks. Uh, as you can also see in the screen here, you know, the UK government came out with a report that says that it has more UK government branded cyber scams than any other subject. So there's really someone uh, or a lot of adversaries uh, trying to exploit new vulnerabilities in the cyber domain. And then also uh, actually a, a big surprise maybe to a lot of us that domestic violence and abuse is uh, dramatically increasing. I know here in Denmark, they have had to double some of the shelters that can take in um, people that are uh, suffering from this and being victimized for, for domestic violence. And that might be you know, on the borderline of where the responsibilities of the employer, employer goes, but it will definitely you know, impact our staff and our colleagues uh, and their ability to solve their daily task and their mental state and their well-being, as Emmanuel also uh, pointed out. So this is a new normal that we have to relate to and, and see how it, uh, it works. And then the obvious that we have a lot of unoccupied business premises where we need to consider um, the threat of burglaries or vandalism, whatever. Uh, so some companies are you know, increasing security guards or installing new physical security measures, whatever, to sort of keep an eye on, on that. And then the new levels of uncertainty, this might be the worst economic crisis since the 1930s. So this is definitely also going to influence our colleagues and the staff of a big organization, uh, maybe in a, in a leading to a belief in, in, uh, in authorities to a, a greater deal and then becoming more vulnerable to cyber attacks and physical attacks. Also, we have to take into account, you know, the, the, the stress as a result of and maybe an existing workload that has to be uh, solved and at the same time uh, staying at home and taking care of the family and you know uh, teaching your kids in school and all that um, that also could lead to bad decision making and additional stress on the people that have to sort of apply and and follow the guidelines and rules that the security departments have sent out earlier and then as we can see you know the criminal elements are still there though they don't disappear and their revenue stream if you want to call it that is also disrupted and that is might also be why we see an increase in cyber fraud and we will see definitely that criminals are trying to sort of exploit new vulnerabilities and also get a, a certainty of, of a revenue in place as uh, normal businesses would do. A recent survey uh, done uh, by Clear C's research uh, points out that 74% of the participants, security managers, point to uh, disruptions in supply chain. That that's not a maybe might not be a big um, surprise to anyone but it also means new vendors uh, uh, new diligence due diligence processes new vetting processes that security professionals have to consider and um, it also means that new logistics can introduce sort of new territory in terms of threats vulnerabilities and and um, and the necess or the need for reviewing existing measures uh, in order to sort of mitigate these new risks as they are introduced um, we also see that 74% of the security managers foresee disruptions over the next 12 months to their businesses stability. And that might not be a, sort of a, a big um, surprise to us either, but it will mean that most of our organizations will have to cut costs, optimizing their business and rethinking even their business models, uh, maybe also adapting, rethinking their business strategies. And that um, comes back to the security professional that we also have to adapt our security programs, our policies, the way we define KPIs and how we sort of align with the organization's strategy and, and deliver value to the organization. So we also have to, to adapt and uh, into new times. And then always there is of course, local context. We know that the different countries are at different stages and have different strategies to cope with the COVID-19 pandemic. And, and we have differences in culture and society, of course. So again, underlining the need for uh, local information and, and not just information, but also information that has been analyzed into intelligence 
you know, what does that mean to my organization that X, Y, or C is happening in this area? And a few ideas on how to stay updated, also trying to link in a little bit uh, into what Emmanuel said earlier. Um, you know, <clears throat> we have to stay updated in order to have a basis for making decisions. Intelligence, not just covering, you know, relevant for the COVID-19 situation, but internal intelligence in the shape of incident reporting is, again, just uh, crucial. I've come across many organizations that did not prioritize uh, the, um, the, the sort of the systematic uh, collection of uh, internal incident reports. So you have to have a system that is designed to um, um, collect the information that is relevant to you as an organization, but also so that you can track changes in the development over time. So we not just use, you know, whatever spreadsheet or Excel to, to document it, but also a system that will help you to, to track changes and see trends and analyze what is going on in your organization. And it will obviously also save your organization and department in security or risk or wherever you are in, in collecting data and analyzing and also making it ready for presentation to the senior management. Uh, so, so we are standing on, on top of that. Then we have the element of involvement. Uh, you know, keep a security management program simpler than might feel right as a security professional because then you can communicate what you are actually trying to achieve to people that don't work in security. And that is key if you want to change behavior and have an effect and use uh, you know, the understanding and the ability to create relationships across the organization to help gather information. And it might be a little bit late if, if you start doing that now when you really rely on the information. So that is see it as an investment early on, basically to being able to pull information from across the organization. And this will also enable you to, to approach the situation in a more holistic uh, approach, a way, because we have to bring together, you know, facilities management, uh, cybersecurity and IT, health and safety experts, human resources, the legal department, risk and compliance, and of course, also security, uh, even now have to work even more closely and, and overlapping as, as the threat landscape changed and the reality changed uh, in, in terms of which risks, threats, risks, whatever that we have to uh, analyze and encounter. The overview that I've stated out here as the third element is an approach that will help you to establish uh, based on the updated information that talks very much about the, maybe the integration of IT systems or you know, the framework that enables you to uh, have the relevant information and analysis at hand when it is necessary uh, and the processes to, uh, to overview the data and be timely updated that is key to also making decisions again and have it um, when you, you uh, need it. I see an increasing number of organizations, you know, spending a lot of resources to gather information, compile it, aggregate it, whatever, and, and put it into nice slide decks or whatever. Uh, and it's, it's just so much time that is spent on very manual processes that could be automated uh, by using uh, more maybe modern tools to, to support that. And then finally, the strategic uh, approach, a key focus area for me always, you know, being aligned with an updated strategy and the challenges that your organizations are seeing. We talked about the, uh, the new business models that will come out of this crisis. Uh, it's not easy and it's, it's uh, you know, the heavier set of policies and standards uh, that you might have, the, the, the more it takes to adapt and change to the new situation. But there's definitely room for uh, setting new KPIs and new goals in order to support the organizations as they, as they manage this new uh, COVID-19, new normal, as we call it here. Uh, and as we talked earlier about cost optimization, work from home might not be a thing that goes away uh, anytime soon, and increased cyber threat, changes in physical threats, you know, and we have to adapt to that and, and change how we think and what we measure and what we try to do and the value that we try to add to our uh, and contribute uh, with our to our organizations where we work. Leading from that information and intelligence gathering is the next natural step uh, is then how you effectively mitigate those uh, threats or risks that you have identified. I would say risk here, of course, as you sort of take your own vulnerability into account in, in when identifying the threats and, and analyze them. But one thing is, you know, identify the relevant measures and uh, as the organization's the situation changed, so will our uh, threat landscape also change, as I've said a few times here. And then secondly, you know, keep it extremely simple. I think right now, a lot of our colleagues are being bombarded with information 
uh, also in private life, you have to adapt to a new situation with uh, your personal life and the school and kindergarten, whatever you are, uh, are caught in as a family. Uh, so I think it's also important that security managers are keeping things extremely simple and uh, as possible. Basically reduce the licks uh, and, and maybe look at some of the most successful uh, political communicators of today, you know, <laughs> uh, repeating what you say, keeping it simple, the rule of three and all that, that will help sort of uh, uh, help you communicate what you're trying to say. And then where possible, make the rules and processes the easy choice. Also in acknowledging that the human being uh, may be a bit lazy or might find the easy way out. Uh, security is not necessarily on the highest priority uh, right now for a lot of people and, and especially not during the pandemic. So if we want to have effect of the measures that we identify, we have to make it really easy and, and simple to, to uh, follow. And that may also compromise a little bit on the, the top uh, ambition of our, of our policies. Um, personally, I, you know, I really enjoy Bruce Hallis and his podcast, Rethinking the Human Factor. A lot of inspiration for how to uh, design security programs so people understand what is uh, relevant and necessary and, and makes it easy to, to follow and adapt to processes and policies. And then there's the whole thing, of course, you know, follow up, check it, test it, and adapt your mitigating issues in order to improve again. So again, set KPI, something that will help you measure the implementation. It could be something as, uh, you know, uh, easy as uh, responsible persons and deadlines, and of course also KPIs that will um, help you to, you know, indicate whether or not the implementation of the measures have been done successfully or, or uh, not. Um, I think that was sort of a recap of the classical disciplines within security risk management. And I've included a little bit uh, on business continuity management, business continuity planning, because I don't think there's a doubt that this is also going to be part of the new normal and businesses are going to be looking at this and you know, looking into the future and see how can we be better prepared. So one thing is updated security risk management. Uh, another thing is how to use this experience also to improve the level of preparedness. And some organizations I'm sure have been very well prepared, you know, from the articles that I've read and the business leaders and interviews that I've seen and security managers I've talked to, many organizations were just not prepared at us to a satisfying level. And I think we can also expect that senior management uh, may be more forthcoming to security or risk managers that sort of propose spending resources on updating the business continuity management processes. Uh, so, well, I know that could be a long series of webinars for itself. So I just wanted to point out a few of the most common mistakes that I've come across in my career and maybe suggest a way forward. Um, common errors that we see is that the organizations prepare for a crisis uh, and continuing their businesses. They can have a tendency to build that on a series of sort of predefined scenarios and spend a lot of time building those scenarios uh, that really seldom actually happen. And as a former army officer, I, you know, I would always prefer to be prepared with a plan and then adapt it than to have no plan at all. Uh, but there can just be a lot of efforts put into describing the detailed scenarios that might, might be a, a waste of, of time, basically, and resources at the end. Uh, building the preparedness on, on the existing hierarchy of the organization is also, you know, includes some vulnerabilities. Uh, for example, that key personnel is not available due to, you know, travel or absence or whatever. Um, and then, you know, the, the time-sensitive decision-making that, uh, that needs to be done is just not possible because everybody's waiting for the CEO to show up and, and make decisions in times of, of crisis that has been seen a lot of times. So the typical approach here as a CEO, as a head of the crisis committee, and also the heads of function as IT, HR, operations, legal, etc., are then responsible for each area. And they might actually, in crisis, be needed elsewhere. They, they will need, after 48 or 72 hours, they will need to rest and come back. And they will also definitely need help to sort of uh, implement all the tasks that have been decided in, in crisis management. Uh, we've been going at this pandemic 19 um, crisis management mode for four weeks now. So I think, you know, naturally you have to uh, have more people involved and, and focus on roles instead. Um, we've also seen that... Um, and some of the large organizations I've come across that business continuity plans have then been developed across every department, but they've never been put to the test. 
And then the latest example I saw was an organization where, you know, alternative office locations were selected across the entire organization, but not really tested. So a high number of the uh, departments suddenly selected the same building for their sort of alternative uh, physical location. And, you know, there are no IT infrastructure to support that and no room for all the people, et cetera, et cetera. So there's, there's just some super important key learnings to pick up when you actually test your 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 business continuity plans and then learn from it, adopt it and, and, and test again. I've put in the PDCA, but whatever learning cycle you used, it's it's about test it, learn from it, adapt and then and then test again. Yeah. <clears throat> if we follow the four sort of steps that I put in on the right side of the screen and uh, not reinventing business continuity management at all, I would say there is a few principles that could be helped, you know, identify your critical resources in your organization. That could be IT systems, physical assets, buildings, production equipment, processes, people, knowledge, et cetera. And then define for how many you know, hours, days or weeks or months that you could live without those and, and um, the disruption of, of that resource and how that also will influence you know, the availability of other critical resources. For example, if we can't use building X, then we can not also access our hosting invent environment and then we can use IT system, X, Y, C, whatever. So it's all interlinked and we have to have that sort of cascade of, of uh, actions uh, detailed. Uh, and then we have to define alternatives, you know, and also put into the time plan when you need to start activating those alternatives so they're ready to take over for the primary critical resources. And that can be anything really, you know, organizations have hotels identified as alternative physical locations, work from home, relocation, hibernation, whatever, VPN connections, everything that sort of enable them to do different from the primary resources and, and manage and keep uh, processing and, and keep continuing their business. Again, put it to the test and learn from it and, and keep it extremely simple. So, um, so um, yeah, uh, you can go about it without uh, having to write a big book. It doesn't have to be a lot of pages to be, make a really good business continuity plan that is actionable and easy to implement. So all this is leading to a new normal to summarize a little bit. I think the principle of just in time and manufacturing and super optimizing our supply chain strategies, that is going to be interesting to follow. You know, will there be an increase in inventory? Are there going to be strategic reserves? Or are we going to see organizations splitting up their sourcing channels, supply routes and storage? Um, you know, will the traditional cost benefit calculations still hold? Um, is there going to be an increase in the focus on the environment and our global footprint here that there's some tendencies that will, that will support that. Uh, also in terms of supply and vendor strategy, you know, will companies expand their supply chains and what does that mean to us as security professionals? We will see an increased focus on, on vetting and due diligence processes that we have to support because our organization will have to have, you know, different suppliers for and not just one sole partner or, or supplier in place. And then the, the workforce, you know, this is my best guess, but it's going to have an, a huge impact. Will we see more temporary contract workers to, re, you know, improve the agility, flexibility of, of the organization? Or will we see governments, you know, demand that more workers have benefits? And how would that differ from different political systems uh, globally? Uh, how will we as security professionals, how are we going to navigate in vetting and security training and compliance? How are we going to handle that when the workforce is so much more fluid? and interchangeable. How will companies embrace, you know, the rapid digital transformation and, and the increase in remote working? And, uh, and how will this influence, you know, sort of, it's gonna be a kickstart, the inclusion of more automation and intelligence, artificial intelligence into the work roles in order to make organizations more, you know, decrease reliance really on, on people and, and move to the digitized world uh, uh, in, in, in more ways. Um, your guess is as, as good as mine, but I, I definitely see that also on, on a global globalization, will we see an increase on a more national focus, both in terms of consumer behavior, you know, from buying global to, to buying more local. And I'm talking both business to business and business to consumer in terms of products and services and, and travels. That's going to be really interesting to follow as well. So in respect of time here, that's just my two cents in terms of how we will see some um, and, and can see some changes in, in security risk management. Um, a little 
drumming for our own course here that we've made actually a lot of resources available for free uh, also before the pandemic 19 uh, COVID-19 here but we have a series of checklists that you can use that will help both the managers and your employees uh, going through the different steps of ensuring that physical security and cyber security is up to date when working from home is the new normal but also checklists that will help managers consider the mental health and the well-being basically of of employees and they're available both as PDFs, but also we've made our online questionnaire module uh, free for use um, during this uh, COVID-19. So you can actually send out questionnaires to your staff and get the results back again, supporting that you document and track the results and measure the results in order to um, adapt the mitigating measures, basically, as I, I said earlier. We have a lot of templates that will help you build your business case from a security perspective or um, how to build a threat evaluation system in your security program, uh, guides on doing site security risk assessments and videos to support that. That is also free to use on our website. And then finally, you know, um, templates and guides, stakeholder map analysis, for example, or how to define these security operational KPIs that I've been talking about. Then we have some available guides that you can download and, and use for, for inspiration. So a lot of words from my side, just to, to side, just to sum up, uh, you know, if you can remember just these four uh, key uh, areas here, then I'll, I'll hope that uh, it's been worth your time, but, you know, align with the changes that will influence your organization, you know, change business model and change uh, strategy, uh, communicate in a simple way and communicate key messages, establish an updated overview. So you have the relevant information in hand and you have the intelligence that you need both from external vendors maybe, but also from within your organization, incident reporting, building relationships that will help you um, stay on top of what is happening. And then adapting to the new normal, as we saw in terms of um, uh, supply chains, workforce, globalization, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, I, um, if you have any questions, you know, you have the Q and I, Q and A, sorry, um, option at the bottom of the screen. Um, and otherwise, it's all for me. And thank you so much for, for joining our webinar. Great. Thank you so much, Mess. Uh, and thank you also to Emmanuel for your uh, wonderful insights. Um, we've had uh, quite a few questions come through in the Q&A panel. So um, I'm going to start there with the time that we have available. Uh, the first question is for you, Emmanuel. Um, technology applied to travel always brought some challenges with it. Are these challenges still the same as before? And can you give us an example? Uh, thanks, Siobhan. Uh, that's a good question, actually. Um, well, yes, I do agree that uh, travel tech has always brought challenges. Um, I can, I don't know, I can think about privacy concerns related to travel tech being too invasive, and maybe a sense that you were relying too much on travel tech. And I think now, a uh, few weeks, few months into COVID-19, the perspective is very different. Uh, we can look at privacy, for example, the, there was, or there was fear that there would be a lot of resistance to technology, travel tech, being too invasive of personal privacy. So my, my counter question is, can we still afford to be resistant towards privacy when specific technology needs to have access to our private information if we want to fight coronavirus? So I think there will be possibly less resistance about um, privacy uh, intrusions by travel tech. As for like travel tech, uh like not being a very smart move to over rely on travel tech i think now we have no choice in a way we have to live with technology and technology will be more and more necessary for any organization uh when we think about duty of care so i can i can i can think from like one year ago or even just a few months ago before all this happened uh like there will be concerns about over reliance on travel tech in terms of like uh travel tech being prone to human error so it could fail because of human error 
or uh, uh, there could be loss of connectivity or communication problem and then travel tech not working. But then I go back to what I just said. Uh, in the current situation, for our business continuity, uh, to ensure the safety, physical and mental of our employees, we really need to rely, whether we like it or not, on, on travel tech. So I hope this answers it. Great, thank you. Um, and our next question, I think this one is for you, Mess. Could you provide some examples of some of the new KPIs that security teams and managers might be looking at? Um, yeah, ab absolutely. I think um, I think you have to look, uh, you know, closely to the organization and what they're trying to achieve. You know, it's it's. I think it's basic that when you build your security risk management program, talking about security policy and the standards and guidelines and all that, you have to first, as a basis, take a look at the business strategy. Look into the you know annual reports and what the business is trying to do. What are the markets that where we see growth? Uh, uh, which products or services are they trying to to win on? And then sort of draw out how do that what does that mean to me as a security manager or a security professional? How do I support that? And how do I measure on that, if you will? Um, that is one thing in terms of what you're trying to achieve and the value you are trying to support your organization with. Uh, but when we take a look at the KPIs, then you support that by measuring how we, how, we, how we sort of try to achieve that, what I just said. And that could be, you know, um, example of, of um, KPIs within business performance. So uh, as any normal organization could be, you know, within your your own um, uh, support of the of the business performance, how they sort of gain on the strategic goals that they've set up. It could also be within your team, you know, it could be absence rates or performance, other performance rates so that the KPIs of the security team reflects the KPIs of the operational teams trying to, uh, you know, um, achieve what the organization is, is achieving. Then we have, you know, something very security related such as incidents start measuring on the types and 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 severity if you will of the incidents that we experience as an organization and hopefully as a security department you will help bring that down help you know avoid a lot of the incidents happening or at least have a, a certain um, setup to handle it and then there's a response side to that as well how do you measure you're actively are engaged in uh, handling the incidents and preventing the risk that you need to prevent. So that could be obviously also financial elements to that, but also see how your risk levels are being either developing up or down in, in response to that. Uh, and certainly also the, you know, level of prevention. Again, I'll going to refer back to one of the guides that we have on humanrisks.com. You go to guide resources, I think, and guides. There's a full example of KPIs to, uh, I hope that you can be inspired by uh, to to support your your security team. I hope that answered the question. Great, thank you very much. Uh, and I've got another question here for Emmanuel. Uh, could you give us a quick practical example of how a travel risk management platform could help an employer contact an employee and why that is so important? Yes, uh, I think there are some factors um, mentioned in my presentation earlier that we should consider if we want to answer this question. Then I can clearly make a, a catastrophic example pretty easily. So I think the main factors to consider are we are currently working from home and I suspect this will be the new normal for a long time. Uh, whether because it's a necessity in the new uh, coronavirus uh, environment or whether companies will find it increasingly convenient for multiple, multiple reasons. But like, I suspect working from home will be here to stay or not every company clearly, but many will. Um, so this is one aspect. The other is working from home means that a company, an organization does not have control or not the same degree on the safety uh, of their workers. So the, the situation where you try to use duty of care tools changes completely. Um, and, and like it becomes no longer one single office where you have all your workers, but like it becomes like it multiplies uh, to how many uh, workers you have in their, uh, their houses. Uh, so I think uh, like a practical example could be like uh, a natural disaster 
happening uh, uh, near um, to the house of any of your workers. We can, we can imagine anybody uh, working in a country with uh, extreme lockdown measures, such as myself here in Barcelona or, or anybody else in Italy, for example, if there was a major earthquake happening, the natural response would be to having people evacuating their house, going into assembly points and, 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 and being taken care of in those uh, places, but like this would be no longer possible. Clearly, these are catastrophic scenarios, but I think we are getting more and more uh, familiar, unfortunately. With that. Um, so I think making sure with the tracking tools, with a travel risk management platform, as I have described earlier, that you can locate where are my travelers, are they home? And checking that nothing happens near to their home. Not, doesn't need to be a catastrophic earthquake, it could just be a looting down the street or maybe an outage of internet, something pretty scary these days. So I think with the right intelligence and with the right tools, it's possible to monitor that nothing is happening uh, near to your workers. And even if something does happen, you can take prompt action and making sure they are fine. Great, thank you so much for that. Um, we've got a question here uh, that I think is for both of you, but we might start with you, Mess. Laws and regulations impact everything and behaviors during this crisis as countries are issuing huge amounts of regulations and penalties. So what would be the best way to promote knowledge, understanding and compliance as part of duty of care responsibilities? That's a super good question. Uh, you know, there's a bombardment of information right now. And I think you know, the organizations that haven't had a chance to sort of set up a way to uh, to define which channels you should be listening to. Again, as Emmanuel said, there's a lot of misinformation out there as well. But, you know, selecting the right uh, sources of information. And if you don't have the uh, resources to do that internally organization um, within security, then again, work cross organizations. So the communications department or HR, whatever might be uh, able to help you sort of uh, support uh, with resources to follow the right channels and to define uh, what information is relevant to you and what is not. The ones you've done that, you've sort of sorted out, single out. This is the information that we need. This is relevant to us. For example, I saw that from the building management thing on the Danish government has sent out new regulations from how buildings should be ventilated. You know, that's just a little thing, but there's a lot of information to stay on top of, I think, for, for, for managers. So staying on top of those channels, then it's about how you communicate internally in your organization. I think you can have all the systems and IT, whatever in place, but if it's not implemented correctly, that people know they are there, uh, that you've focused how to use it and you've implemented into the capillaries of the organization, you know, it won't really have the, the, the needed uh, effect in order to uh, communicate. And that leads me a little bit back to one of the security managers roles during what I would call peacetime when we don't see something like COVID-19 to build relationships across the organization to make sure that you know the people of your key positions of your organization so you can also involve them uh, uh, when you need to define what information is relevant and, and to communicate it through the, uh, through the organization. Then, of course, I think both, you know, all of us here, uh, you, Siobhan, and me, and Emmanuel, uh, and are representing, and uh, Susanne as well, uh, representing companies that build IT systems that will help you communicate either uh, intelligence or risk information, basically, to how to ensure that central information is not stored somewhere or hidden in a folder on SharePoint, but is actually put into maybe a risk assessment and then you know, directly communicated to the relevant local risk manager, if, if you have that, or facility manager or whatever relevant a contact point there might be. I hope that answered the question. Uh, I will add something. I mean, there is not much to add because I agree with what uh, Max has just said. But I think, yes, uh, the regulatory environment will be a jungle. It will be very hard to navigate it. I mean, I don't want to even think about it right now. But I guess the solution to it comes through cooperation and putting together the right tools, the right platforms and, and, and duty of care uh, instruments with the right knowledge. So if that means bringing together a, an expert of legal aspects, I would say, then 
that is what the travelers will need to know. So uh, there will need to be cooperation and bringing together some more understanding of what uh, the regulation is like. It, it, it's obvious that there is a big legal dimension to it. But the, the, the part of the solution besides cooperation passes through educating and training your travelers, I mean, workers. Uh, they need to know how the new environment is like. Travel managers, uh, human resources managers, security managers to some extent, they will need to know all this. So it will have to be interpreted, understood, and then transformed into company policies that are uh, more or less easily adopted. Great, thank you very much both. I think we have time perhaps for uh, one more question. Um, and I know we've spoken a lot about the uh, intelligence and the information that's available um, on both the risk line and the human risks platform. But when we talk about intelligence um, more broadly, what, are, what do you um, mean by that? Can you tell us, um, and this is to both presenters, can you tell us a bit more about sort of the different sources that can be monitored and also the actual kind of content that is available on the platforms? Uh, Mess, do you want to kick us off? Yeah, absolutely. I think, again, it has to uh, rely highly on the, um, the, the first stages that I'm, I talked about early on about identifying which information you need. Now I just call it information, I think to be more specific and precise, you know, in my world, information is just something that you pick up from a newspaper or, you know, and, and once you have somebody to sort of analyze and draw out conclusions, what does that mean to me and my organization? And, and how does that affect me? And it is relevant to me uh, or us that it certainly becomes, it changes from information to intelligence. That would be part of my definition. But so you have to define what information you need in order to make decisions. It can be internal uh, incident reports that I talked about, you know, you need to start measuring what is happening internally in your organization if you want to mitigate risks. Um, you might also be uh, talking to a company like Riskline because you need the updated disruptions that happens within, you know, crime and terrorism and travel disruptions and, and political health and medical and all that, 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 a company like Riskline can provide you with, or or combine that with the, some of the social media monitoring tools, where you might be needing uh, more local information and 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 detailed information that is super relevant to your organization, but might not be so relevant to the the broader perspective or the broader view of organizations. In terms of human risks, you know we have an incident reporting module, and and that is of course because we think it's it's very important and key. And the incident reporting module feeds data into the risk assessment module. So we have both the internal incident reports feeding into the risk assessments, but we can also integrate with vendors like Riskline. So you can actually take the data feed from Riskline and have it automatically fed into the human risk system. So it'll help you stay updated on the incidents that happen within you know certain categories and and a defined geographic area from your physical sites for example or your travel destinations or wherever physical locations you want to monitor uh, closely I, I hope that um and then there was, of course there's a selection of news channels etc that you want to follow and maybe something you don't want to follow and and have have, to have that combination thanks Thanks, Matt. Uh, I can add something to that. I think, I think if we are asking ourselves, mm, which sources should I monitor? We are missing the point. Uh, the point here should be uh, that the level, overwhelming level of information out there on the internet and the level of complexity and risks in the world we are living in is so much that we need to have a dedicated uh, work of analysis of open sources, social media, other website, official sources, and someone who can track this, what is happening 24 seven, interpreting whether this is something that is going to affect your organization or not. And then if yes, assessing the, assessing the risk. But I think uh, it should really be stressed how this is a process rather than uh, simply pointing at two or three sources that should be used, but it's a process of being able to identifying, 
validating and assessing information and transforming it into actionable intelligence. Great. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we've um, actually run a little bit over time and I do apologize for that. Um, I thank you uh, to our presenters, Mess and Manuel, for your wonderful insights uh, into this very difficult for everyone situation. Um, unfortunately, we didn't get to all of the questions. So uh, if you want to reach out to the emails that you can see on the screen, contact at riskline.com or info at humanrisks.com to ask those questions. Um, those email addresses will reach our presenters. Uh, and we'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. Um, and please stay safe wherever you are. Thank you very much for coming along.